Hello, Commissar Mark here. This is the first video in the series named Governor's Academia. In this series I will teach you the basics of governing your cities in a game named CZ3. It is isometric 2D RTS slash city builder made by Impressions Games in the year 1998. To this day it is considered to be one of the best city building games on the market and the game itself has a large following from the day of its release to this day. You can find custom maps, other tips and tutorials on site named CZ3 Haven. I will provide link to this website in the description below. If you have any experience playing this game before, you might not find these initial videos very useful as I will focus on every little basic thing, suggesting that you never played this game before so I will explain everything thoroughly and slowly. Please note that none of these things were discovered solely by myself and it is the communal knowledge of the whole CZ3 community, namely people on CZ3 Haven, which are masters of the game, CZ3 streamers and developers on Augustus mod. First thing in order is to touch upon the two amazing mods for this game, which make it possible to play the game in high resolution and it brings many useful features to make the game more enjoyable and has quality of life improvements. One of the mods is called the Julius mod and it retains most of the base game's features so you can experience the vanilla experience as if it was intended by the original developers without impacting balance. The other mod is called Augustus mod. This mod brings you many new buildings, mechanics, even walkers and roadblocks. I highly recommend that you first play through the game using Julius mod so you can experience the campaign as was intended so you can learn the game and then you can expand upon your knowledge with playing around using Augustus. I will provide you with links to both of these mods in the description of this video. One more thing to note is that the campaign itself has integrated tutorial which explains many things about this game. However, it often fails to explain its mechanics in great detail which may lead to some misconceptions and suboptimal designs of your cities. We will try to amend this in this series. For explaining the most basic features, I will often use blank maps such as this one, so I don't confuse you visually with things that are unnecessary, and we can focus on the thing at hand. When starting each map, you should immediately hit a pause button, in this case I can hit spacebar to pause or unpause the game. If you cannot do that because you are not using Julius mode or Augustus mode, you should reduce the game speed to the minimum amount of 10%. This is necessary, so you can allow yourself some time to take in your surroundings and identify necessary points of interest on the map. If you do not take care, some maps actually progress quite quickly and the events on them can snowball. In the top left corner of the screen, you can see that there is a file tab. If we click on it, it, it will allow you to replay the map, load your saved game, save your game, delete file, exit to main menu or exit the game entirely. Another tab is called options. From here, you can customize the game speed, difficulty setting and other features if you are using the Augustus mode. Right next to this is your city coffers status. The DN stands for Denarii, which is the currency of the Roman Empire in this game. As you can see right now, we have 37,500 Denarii in the city's coffers. Right next to this indicator, we can see that there is a pop indicator, which means the counter of inhabitants in your city. Right next to this, we can see that there is a date overlay. This will show you the current date. It can be used to track progress through specific maps if you remember its timeline. However, 
it will itself not impact the game in any meaningful way. The events are all scripted. In the top right corner of the screen you can see that there is an overlay tab. If we click on it, it will bring various overlay tabs. We will touch upon each of these separately. For now, just note the location of the overlay is in the top right corner of your screen. Right under the overlay tab is your minimap. When you shift position on the map, it will indicate it on the minimap, which can be useful to navigate larger provinces. Right under the minimap on the left side is your advisors button. This will bring you to your advisors, which each covers a different category of city services, economy or Caesar's favor. We will touch upon each of these tabs in the future. For now, just note that advisor tab is located right under the minimap. It may be confusing, but you will not gain access to this tab right away if you are playing the campaign. It will unlock after you play the second mission. Right next to this, on the right side under the minimap, is the Empire Trade screen. It also has many features which we will explain in bigger detail at a later video. For now just note its location. Right under the Advisors tab is your Assignment. If you click on this, it will bring up the instructions for the campaign scenario. However, if you are playing custom maps such as this one, clicking on it will not display any information. Right beside this assignment tab are three buttons that allow you to navigate the map in different directions. You can rotate the map counterclockwise or clockwise via these buttons or return to your original position by this button. Right under these buttons is your user overlay which features building structures building roads or clearing obstacles. On each map you start with a road coming through it. There are two signposts placed upon this road, each touching the edge of the screen. The red signpost indicates that it comes from the city of Rome. This means that this is the arrival point for all the people and land trader caravans on the map. You can easily associate red color of the signpost with the city of Rome itself, as it is often depicted as such in mainstream media. The other signpost has blue color and it leads to the Empire. This means that this is the exit point of the map for all the people and land trader caravans. When placing down any roads or structures, you will actually build upon tiles. This means that the map is split up into grid system. This means that right now we are placing just a single road tile. If we place another but stretch it, it will actually claim two tiles. We can drag this however long we want. Each road tile should be placed with a purpose, as it will impact walkers which we will touch upon next. If we place down a road and we place a structure, such as an engineer's post. You can click on it and see that it requires employees. It requires 5 employees to operate, but it says that we have no people in the city. Therefore, we should place down some rudimentary housing near the entry point, so the people arrive fast. We will increase the game speed a little bit until some people arrive and live in this housing. It is good thing to note when placing down housing plots that they themselves need to be placed two tiles away from the road at maximum, otherwise they will despawn after a short while. After we've placed some housing on the map, you can see that this engineer's post now sends out a walker. This person walks out from the engineer's post and will seek out labor. It is therefore called a labor walker. You can easily identify him by his brown tunic. You can see that he walks down the path we set out for him. If we for example were to stretch this road even further, 
he will follow this path. There is a limit to how far these walkers we walk, will walk, which means that if we stretch the road to very long degree, it will actually not cover the whole area. The purpose of the labor walker is to seek labor and allocate people from your population to this engineer's post which sent out the labor walker has to activate it. We can do this by placing down a single house and waiting until the emigrant arrives. Once the labor walker touches this tent, it will power the engineer's post and it will send out a walker. You can see that the, mission, the engineer's post is active by the flying blue flag at the pit. If we click on it, we can actually see that it still has poor access to employees. We can fix this if we expand the housing, because the labor walker has spent just a sm small amount of time walking nearby housing. If he spends more time walking nearby houses, it will actually provide full labor access to this engineer's post, and the labor walker will no longer be sent out for some time. When we check up on the initial housing area we placed earlier, we can see that it is burning down. This is because there is another risk apart from collapsing buildings. It is fire risk. We need to place down a prefecture to combat fires. We should do the same in this lower area where we place the engineer's post and a house. We should also place another engineer's post up here, because prefectures do have risk of collapsing. We will cut this road as to allow the walkers from these buildings to just walk in one direction that we want them to. Since this house burned down, we will actually need some more people in the city. For this reason, we will actually place some more housing. Now we will wait until the situation resolves itself. You can see that the prefecture has powered itself and has found the necessary labor. This means that it, sent, it has sent out a prefect. It is this person with a blue cape and a helmet. If he sees any fires in his radius, he will actually run up to them with buckets of water and extinguish them. Otherwise, the purpose of this walker is to reduce crime in a neighborhood where he walks by the road, he will reduce crime in the nearby houses. You can use the prefects to also combat gladiators if they riot or in a very dangerous situation where enemy invasion has breached your provincial defenses, you can actually use prefects in a pinch to defend against few attackers who manage to reach your housing, but it is always preferable to avoid such situations. That is because the Prefect is not very competent fighter and he mostly cannot take down a single enemy combatant one on one. If we check overlay and risks, we can actually access fire damage risk. We can see that this tent has negligible risk of fire, it is indicated by this column. The column will rise as long as no Prefect has walked past it and reduce the risk. Right now we saw that this just happened. We can check on this same thing with damage, which means damage from collapsing buildings. This prefecture has small risk of collapsing, but the engineer fixes it by walking past it. You always want to ensure that your city is properly covered by prefects and engineers. Anywhere that you have housing or other structures, because most of them will attract fire or burn down. When touching upon specific buildings that do not have a risk of collapsing or be set on fire, I will mention them, but for now this will suffice. For this next tip I will need to place down some more houses. Once people move in, we will talk about a global labor pool. 
It is a feature in the game that is not explained in the campaign, but it is often necessary to fulfill the various goals easily and efficiently. These people have now moved in. If we place down a senate building in this area and click on it, it will say that it requires 30 workers to operate. If we click on this tent, it will say that only 20 people live in it and it is usually the case that not all of these people will be workers, some of them will be children or old people which do not work. Furthermore, these buildings are also running. If we check out the labor walker from the senate and see him walk past this housing, Click on the Senate, we can see that it, it actually acquired all the labor necessary. It is because all the housing on the map is actually connected. This house actually allows you to tap all the available labor on the entire map. If you for example had a big housing block in one area where there is plentiful food and water and just had a single tent in your industry area that is separated by a mountain or something like that, it would allow you to access all the labor necessary without having to cart food around which is very inefficient. You can use this to power your distant industries. Road layout is actually one of the most important features of your cities in Caesar 3. If we for example place down an intersection right here and watch the walker patterns, we will see some suboptimal behavior happen. Sometimes these walkers will actually walk down this path, like this tax collector from the senate. When he walks back to the intersection, he will choose again which direction he will go. What might happen is that this prefect might, might walk down this path, then choose to go in this direction, turn back around and then go back the way he came. In this case, this whole area would not be covered by fire risk protection, which might lead to fires. This means that you want to avoid having intersections where possible. If you need them for some reason, you can actually place down a gatehouse building to facilitate an offshoot without interfering with your walker patterns. A gatehouse itself is a military structure, which means that you might gain access to it a bit later in the campaign. If we stretch down a road from this gatehouse and watch the walker patterns, we should see that they do not view this as an option to walk through this. It is because the gatehouse itself acts as a roadblock, which prevents walkers from walking past it. If we click on the overlay screen and then commerce and then desirability, we can actually see that the gatehouse emits negative desirability, which is negative for your housing that is around this structure. However, buildings such as the senate actually emit positive desirability around it, which is beneficial for your housing, which we will touch in greater detail later on. For this next tip, we need to place down some more houses, so let's expand this area. We will wait until people move in. Now we can place down a theater building, which provides entertainment access to housing. It is not necessary for this tent, but it is necessary for showing off the next walker type. We need to develop this area so we can actually provide some services around it. If we place small tent around this gatehouse, it will actually provide walkers that pass down this path access to some labor. Let's place down an engineer's post and prefecture in this area, so we cover this area with protection from fire and collapsing buildings. We will need to wait until people move into this location as well. You can see 
that the theater sends out its own walker. It is this purple guy, Hector. If we check entertainment access for theaters, we can see that this tent has theater access. The walker provides it by walking past it and it has a cooldown. It is often a good idea for the walkers to pass by this housing in timely fashion so as not to allow this housing to drop this column to unreasonable levels because that means that they will lose the access to this specific service. If we place down an actor's colony in this area which we just developed, it will actually send out actors to this theater. It will raise the entertainment rating of this building, providing better shows for the people since it has trained actors in it. However, you can notice that the rest of the walkers will not pa walk past the gatehouse as we mentioned earlier. If we wait until this building sends out its walker, you can see that he just passed through the gatehouse. This is because he does have a destination. In this case, it is this theater. These walkers are called destination walkers and you can use this behavior in different manner. Most of the warehouse workers, some of the market ladies and some, uh, some workshop uh, carters are actually destination walkers, same as service providing buildings like this actress colony, gladiator school or a line house. Just keep these things in mind. We will expand upon this information in the future. One more thing that I forgot to mention is placement of the engineer's post and prefects on the end of the line. When you place down a road and it has a dead end like this, it is often a good idea to place down your prefect and engineer at the end as to ensure that these walkers will actually walk in one direction and always get and always provide access to the fire protection and protection from collapsing to these buildings that might be placed around this road. This brings us to another topic, which is another design of road layout. This is a single line which has two dead ends. It is not the most efficient way to design your road layout. The most efficient way is actually to connect it up and form a, a loop. What this means is that the walkers will be able to walk the whole way around and access the building from the other side. It is not a good idea to have intersections, but the loop does not have any, which means that the walkers will always walk in predictable fashion and you can actually utilize the maximum amount of area. For this next step, we will place down some more housing in this area. We will wait for the people to move into this location. You can see that there is water right here. These people living in these tents are small tents, which do not have even the primitive access to water. We can fix this by providing them with, for example, wells. Wells offer good early game option if you are not planning to evolve these people to any significant level, but just providing them with water means that they will evolve into large tents if the desirability of the area is high enough. This means that it will actually house a few more people than it if it was just a small tent. You will wait until more people move into these tents. You can see that this small tent houses 20 occupants. However, this large tent has 18 people in it and still extra room for more people than in this example. It is therefore a good idea to densify your housing in this manner. It also means that people that get access to water are less rowdy and less likely to cause problems. When talking about problems, let's talk about the first tab in the advisors. It is this financial tab. It is usually a good idea when starting any map to drop down your taxes to 0%. 
this is because you, you will not be sending out any tax collectors anyway and people might get bad opinions of you even if nobody is physically con collecting the tax just having set tax rate will actually offset their opinion of you if you are not using Augustus mod. Another idea for providing people with water is giving them fountain access. This is more long term solution because it will allow you to have these people evolve much further if you give them food and other necessities which we will we'll touch upon later. For now you can see that the fountain which needs to be placed in the reservoir will, uh, reach will actually provide much larger area with access to water. If we check down water tab in the overlay section you can see that this is all the area that has piping from the reservoir. This fountain is placed within the piping reach and then itself it provides the fountain water access which is this blue color to all the surrounding tiles. When you want to stretch your water in this example we have a river running through the map right here. But if we wanted to water the people near the entry point, we would have to actually uh, use the aqueduct system. We will place down a reservoir in a location that will be able to cover all the housing necessary with fountain access. Then we will select aqueduct from our water services screen. Then stretch the aqueduct down and connect it to the other one. Keep in mind that the Reservoirs themselves are actually a little undesirable. You can see that this reservoir is now filled as well. You can use this to provide fountain water to these people. It is good idea to take note of your fountain placement because each fountain actually employs four people in it. When placing down aqueducts, if it, it is often a good idea to provide access through it for immigrants, walkers or even troops. This is so that we do not cut off the road from Rome. If we do so, it will cause horrible problems, as our engineers will then frantically try to remove all obstacles to allow the road from Rome access. This means that it will delete your aqueducts housing, structures or other things. We can see that random event has not triggered. It is triggered by bad health of the city. It is an epidemic. You can see that fumigation has happened in this housing area. It is because we did not provide any clinic access to these people. We can fix this by placing down a doctor. We will do so in this block as well. To offset the fact that we just lost a bunch of people, we will place down another house. These fires are special because they are not able to be extinguished by prefects. They will not care for them, but they will also not spread to nearby buildings, which regular fires will. It will just take some time for these fires to die down and then we can safely remove the remains. Rubble in this game is actually passable by walkers if they need to pass through it. That counts the same for soldiers. But it does not count as a road style, which means that regular walkers will not, in it will not interfere with their patterns, as you can see. You can remove the ruins by using the clear land tool. Clear land tool actually is able to even remove trees. However, it is not able to remove rocks or cliffs or water. There are actually gods in this game. There are five of them. We can click on the advisor tab and then religious tab to see them. There is Ceres, the goddess of fertility and farming. Neptune, the god of the sea and trade. Mercury, the god of commerce. Mars, the God of your military and Venus, the goddess of love. All of these gods can actually send out curses on your city if you do not build them temples necessary. But in other case, if you 
build them their necessary temples and do well, they will actually bless your city in different fashion. You can access our temples from the religious tab. We then click on the small temples. We will click on all button which is provided by the Julius or Augustus mods which means that you can cycle through all the temples without having to individually click them. We will place down four of these temples here and one of them in the other area. The temples actually provide positive desirability around them. Each temple will employ two employees. Once the temples are operational, the gods should be placated. When you place down these temples, each of them will actually provide you with 750 people in your city safe space in that god's eyes without him getting angry at you for not giving him his due temples. There are actually other religious structures which might provide you with better access to pawn down the gods, but we will not touch upon these temples or structures just yet. One of the last things that I will mention in this episode is actually one of the things that is quite counterintuitive. If your city is being hit by many fumigation events, which means bad health as we had before in this area, it is not a good idea to build hospitals. They will take 30 workers, but they will actually not provide you with any protection from the plague. Only doctor's clinics will provide you with prevention of the diseases. Hospital is actually used to provide access to patricians, which is a late game option, which we will not touch upon right now. The final thing I will mention in this video is Caesar. In this game, you have to manage your favor. In this case, we can see that we have 32 favor with Caesar. If we click on the advisors tab, and then go to Imperial Advisor. It will actually show us what is our current favoriting with text down below it, which specifies how he feels about you. In most maps, you will have a salary. In this map, we do not have any, but usually you will have. If you, for example, had salary of five denarii per month, you will be able to stockpile this salary in your personal coffers. The salary is paid from your city's coffers to you directly. You can actually send gifts to Caesar if you have enough money. When you click on the send gift button, it will display several gifts to be dispatched. However, only if we have the necessary funds. In this case, we do not have any money, but if we would have some, it would display that we can send three kinds of gifts. Small gift, medium gift and then a lavish gift. Lavish gift is always the best option, since it costs 200 denarii and provides you with 10 favor with Caesar. It is good idea to send him this gift as soon as you hit 200 savings. You can actually give your money to the city if you want. If you, for example, mismanage your salary and you end up with 250 denarii in your coffers, you can give, you can give 50 denarii to the city and then dispatch the gift. This is because if you have over 200 in your personal savings, the gift to Caesar will actually scale with what you have, so you might end up with ridiculous amounts. Other thing about the salary is that when you start the map and you start at some level, if you decrease this level by one and pay yourself lesser salary, Caesar will actually lose favor with you at slower rate. Initially, he will lose favor with you by 2 points per year. However, if you set your salary by one level lower than what you are due, he will actually lose just one favor point with you. This is very useful for some missions where Caesar can get quite pissy. Or you might go into debts, which we will explain later. Another tab which is necessary to mention is Labor Advisor. In this case, you can see all the workers that are working in different industries and services throughout the city. If we were, for example, hit by severe worker shortage, we could disable some industries, 
but it is usually a good idea to keep your engineering, water services and prefectures running as these are necessary for all the other things to not burn down and collapse. You can actually set wages for your citizens down here. It is the amount of money each of them is paid during the year. Rome pays 30 means that the Rome is paying 30 denarii per year to its employees. You always want to match this number, otherwise people will get very unhappy or might not want to immigrate into your city. In some maps, this number might rise or fall, depending on scripted events. If you want to increase your popularity, you can actually increase your wages by clicking this arrow or decrease it by hitting this arrow. You can see down here that there is estimated annual bill. This means how much in wages you will actually pay during a single year. I hope this video was useful in some way, especially to people who do not know anything about this awesome game. I definitely recommend it. It's usually ab about 6 euros on Steam or GOG, so you can get it quite cheap and definitely will provide you with many hours of entertainment.